Hello, everybody. Thank you for letting me join you today. Um, we're going to talk about local motors, we're going to talk about the automotive industry, and we're going to talk about products. Uh, I cannot claim to be an exponential organization, but I can definitely claim to tell you what it is that we've done over the last seven years, and hopefully you can be the judge over whether it's exponential or not. Uh, there is lots that we have to share, and I'm guaranteed of only one thing that I will not have a chance to share at all with you today. So we're going to try and we're going to start. Local Motors, for me, in the way that we started, is a world of vehicle innovations. That's how we started. And Peter's right. I uh, found myself in the desert. Two of my friends were killed in 2004, two of my great friends in the Marine Corps while we were on deployment in Iraq. And I decided that I was going to make a difference in their honor. And what I loved was vehicles. It's what I knew. And so I thought, in a sort of quixotic journey, that I would create a company that could build vehicles better because nobody else was doing that. Turns out that's a super arrogant thought and very difficult to get done. And uh, I found that out in the first month of exploration. And so, uh, um, so I stuck to my journey, though. And, uh, um, and what you see now is the result of that and the result of the work of a great team around the world and an incredible community. And I'm going to explain a little bit more what we mean by community. But the start of Local Motors was to become a world of vehicle innovations. We wanted to build those vehicles that nobody else could or nobody else would. We wanted to figure out what was in the way between new materials, better fuel efficiency, other things like that. And that's what we set off doing with Local Motors. So we think of it as co-creation and micro multinational manufacturing. And we definitely now can see that it is reshaping national competitiveness. Over 50 locations in the world have sat down in talks with us to be able to bring this technique to their area, this area. And I'm not a motivational speaker or somebody that has some sort of snake oil in a jar that says, here, if you just buy this, you will suddenly become competitive. It takes hard work, and it actually takes owning real assets. And if there is any punchline, I think, for what I'm talking about today is we're not a software company, and we're not an IP trade. We're not something that you put $2 in and you take $2 billion out. This is something that is about jobs, it's about livelihood, and it is about making real products that people pay for. That's something that I understand very well. I'm not against a software company. We have had to implement a whole lot of software innovation to make Local Motors work, but it's only a means to an end at Local Motors. So, we want to reshape national competitive, competitiveness while we do these two things, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit. The, the activities that go on in our company are pretty simple, um, but they run afoul of some of those classic business rules, which is sort of like do one thing and do it well. You know, Andrew Carnegie used to say, we're not standing in his hall right now, but he used to say, you know, I put all my eggs in one basket and I watch that basket very carefully. So we don't do that. And that was hard. I think that's one of the things that uh, Salim was talking about and Peter spends so much time talking about is that the world has changed. And it is something which the genie's out of the bottle and it's not coming back. Things move fast. And oh well, we can't just do one thing well. Salim just told you if you could do four out of the ten things that he said, you might be an exponential organization. Well, at least I know that we have to design, build, and sell. That's what we must do in order to be able to be competitive in, a, competitive in this kind of business. And when I think about Local Motors, what we've grown into is if we stick by the ability to design our products, to build our products, and to sell them, we don't even have to stay in the car industry. It's really a recipe for doing hardware product development in many industries, should we choose to. So um, at the middle of it all, which was an exploration, a learning after we started Local Motors, is our community. Now, that doesn't mean like Phyllis, who lives next door, and George, who lives upstairs, and that sort of thing. That is a community, but that's a very geographic community. For Local Motors, our community is a community of passion. Seriously passionate individuals about the kind of product that we make. And the people who I know understand what we do at Local Motors ask the following question. They say, so... How do you get people who love what you do to come help you make it? That's a great question. Other people who don't necessarily understand what we do say, I got it. So you guys can design anything for free on the internet, and you can just get somebody to come in and build it for you at a small microfactory, right? No, wrong. You can't do that because you don't have a community of passion when you just get anyone to come do anything. You all have passions in your life. One of the things that's impressed me about being in the audience today and listening to that is the differences between elation and exhaustion and tiredness and uh, excitement based on what people are talking about. I cannot 
in any way, shape, or form compete with Ray Kurzweil. Guy's got way too much going on in his mind for 99.9% .9 of us in the audience. And some of it is awesome, and others of it is frightening and terrifying. But definitely, definitely we all have different opinions on what we're doing. And that's what we mean when we go after a community of passion. Local Motors plants a flag in the ground and says, we're here for this kind of product development, and if you want to join us, we'll make those dreams become real. That's very rooted in the soul of crowdfunding that you heard about yesterday. After all, you put your money with the product that you want to buy, and if you don't want to buy it, it's not for you. That's what the true basis of building a passionate community of developers means. We saw it start in software, right? Same week that Bill Gates came out and said, give me 10 good programmers and I'll put all the hackers in the world out of business, you had Linus Torvalds saying what? Anybody remember? He wrote out in a little post and it said, do you pine for the days when men were men and they wrote their own device drivers? Awesome. That's a community of passion. So we start with that little kernel, and our community to begin with was designers, engineers, fabricators, and enthusiasts. Designers, engineers, fabricators, and enthusiasts. We could have whole arguments about this alone because you have engineers that say they're designers, and you have fabricators that say they're engineers. But the bottom line is if they're all on the same table together, and they have a core set of passion that they believe in, they like to learn from each other, and they consider themselves honored to be in the same room together. I consider myself, as some of these types of profiles, to be honored to be in the same room as the people that join me in our community. So we started and we started to aggregate them, and these are pictures of what they look like. People often ask, like, what's the demographic you're going after? We don't go after a demographic, we go after passion, and that to me is more well-defined as a psychographic. It's a state of being. It's something that you enjoy to do. And there are children that like it, there are adults that like it, there are professionals that like it, and there are amateurs that like it. There are people that are just simply dreamers, and they want to be part of it, but they don't know how. They're all part of our community for what we started in vehicle innovation. Our microfactory is the other half of that promise, and I promised that, there would be, that the part of this that is probably uncomfortable is we buy real assets. So this is an exponential finance conference. We have been in an aberration for the last 30 years. This gets me in a lot of trouble when I'm in Silicon Valley and I have an opportunity to speak to people. Because the internet investing that Silicon Valley so roundly lionizes forgets the fact that we still need to eat our food, we still need to go places to get things done. After all, you're sitting in the audience. We still need to get together to build those products that are the beam machines that are around. Hardware surrounds our lives, and we are suffused by it. And on the way there, there will be much money made and much money lost. So from a finance perspective, how do we actually get that hardware made was very interesting to me. Because to make a driverless car, it's a piece of hardware. To increment a driverless car to make it better is another piece of hardware. So building a microfactory that was capable of taking these community-based designs and quickly incrementing them was core to our strategy. And I didn't come up with it. I credit it with two gentlemen, one from INSEAD and the other one from Cardiff University. One is a total pacifist and hated the fact that I was in the Marine Corps. He used to lie down in front of bases with his parents in the UK when he was a little kid, and he just couldn't believe that he had actually inspired a Marine to do something great. That was a fun meeting. And, uh, um, and the other one is a great uh, author, Dutch originally. So Peter Wells and uh, um, uh, Joe Neuenhuis were the guys that wrote the subject of the microfactory, and you can read about it, and they've written about seven seminal papers on it. But I did decide to put it into action, and I decided to tie it to a co-creation community, which I think is a really important evolution. So our microfactory is capable of doing things five times faster and with 100 times less capital than everything else in the industry doing these kinds of complex cyber mechanical devices. And what we have in it is we have a design and development team. We have a manufacturing or build floor. And we have a shop. We design, we build, and we sell. These are some of the products that have been designed at Local Motors. We haven't made all of them yet, but they're the kinds of things that our passionate community of vehicle innovators dreams of making. I do believe for Local Motors, my brave Kurzweilian prediction is that we will make the flying cars. We will make the transportation teleportation machines that have yet to come about because we allow the dreamers who think about making this stuff happen to have a space to be able to make it come to life. So the bottom line for me is that we've all lived with the maker uh, movement for the last seven or eight years. We love it, but we need it to grow up a little bit. 
We needed to understand how to put products in a pathway and make it work. A great mentor of mine, Eric von, von Hippel, that wrote the book on democratizing innovation, literally, democratizing innovation, said that there are peer-to-peer -peer sharing networks which need to be left alone. And then there are those people that can actually put products to market. He was predicting what was going to happen in the second era of the maker revolution. So maker plus crowdsourcing plus retail. Design, build, and sell. That's what Local Motors started out, and that's where we've come to. So some detail about what we do. Um, I think this is an important way that we talk about in kicking off all of our competitions. We do a video for people to look at, um, and we tell people about what that is uh, part of. So let me see if I can show you this. You know what? We'll come back to it. I'm going to see if I can go forward to the next slide, if it'll let me. I'll go to the next slide, and we'll talk it through. Okay, so um, uh, what President Obama said is uh, the military needed to make a rapid reaction vehicle for Afghanistan, and they were trying to figure out how to do it faster. At that point, Regina Dugan was running Google. She now is the director of advanced technologies at Google X. And she challenged us to go forward and say, could you work with 20 soldiers, and could you put a vehicle in Afghanistan as a mission purpose vehicle quickly and on a very small budget? And we did it. We did it by crowdsourcing it, and we did it by micromanufacturing it. And the bottom line for the president is was he realized that this can change jobs, it can change lives, both for people on the battlefield and for people that are back at home who are looking for manufacturing opportunities. But what it really does is it changes lives for soldiers in a more meaningful way. It means that they can build things in the field that are actually, or work on building things in the field that are actually suited for the war that they're fighting. And for me, having been a Marine in the field in the infantry, that is everything. You have control of the destiny of the products and you're backstopped by an incredible nation of people people that can make amazing things. All right, so uh, um, we believe this happens because we do things faster, with less cost, and because we bring more people to the table. If somebody asks you, hey, I heard about this company, Local Motors, and they say, what's the difference? The difference is we can do it faster, less cost, because we bring more people to the table. So we compare ourselves here to the th four, three different vehicle programs that you may know, Chevy Volt, Fisker Karma, Tesla Roadster. Three advanced vehicles, if you will. We can build things on average five times faster to get the first 25 vehicles on the road, not the first one. We can do it at 100 times less capital. So instead of using taxpayer dollars to go out and do it, we can do it out of equity funding. We can do it out of customer funding. And then we can put 30,000 people to work on something instead of just having a small team which we've signed an employment contract with. Now there is a little sleight of hand going on here and that is that we can't make a million of these things, but that's the challenge. We don't want to make a million of these things. We want to know whether people want to buy it before we load in and make more. And so we have the opportunity to do thousands. This is my profile on Local Motors. When you go and you set up a profile, you have the ability to be able to contribute. You can contribute ideas, concepts, comments, projects, and you can build a reputation which allows you to be able to help other people make things. It's the basis of a social network. It's just a really focused, passionate-based network. So I'll take you through a simple challenge. The challenge that we most recently ran, or actually three challenges ago, but it seems so recent because it's within the last month, was to design a radical vehicle that could radically reduce part count. Or said differently, we wanted to pit machine capability against the complexity of building a vehicle. There are 25,000 parts in an average vehicle, and that's not even going down into the piston rings and the connecting rods that go in a motor, or the magnets and the windings that go in an induction electric motor. There are a lot of parts in a car. It's adhesives and fasteners and other things like that. So we wanted to get rid of that. I'm gonna go past this video because I don't wanna spend too much time. What we did is we described in a video um, what that was, the challenge, we pitted it in a video, and then we went out. And in four weeks, we took 207 projects in. The vast majority of these people in projects spent over 100 hours on their project, and of the top 20, they spent over 200 hours, maybe in the winning case, well over 300 hours on their project. 30 countries were represented. They did not do this work for free. They did this work for passion and a chance to be the person or the team that was designing a game-changing vehicle. And we've now come upon the winner. So the winner was designed by Michel Anoe. Michel is a man from Italy, and he designed the Strati. And the Strati is very specific. It will be the first 3D printed car in the world that will go into production. 
That's a great honor for Michelle. And this is not 3D printed body panels, that's been done. This is a 3D printed tunable structure where you design it and then you press print and the car is done. Now why do you need to do that? You need to do it because you need to reduce part count. You need to be able to make the structure more modelable by a computer. You need to be able to make it more assemblable so that you can have an easier time changing it as the autonomous car comes along. When our batteries suddenly go from this size to this size, or we suddenly are in a nation which doesn't want electric power and they want to be able to run ethanol-based internal combustion engines. There's too much variability that comes from customers right now. And to always have to go to a company and say, how are you going to build a tool to bend a sheet of carbon fiber or steel or aluminum or anything else and put all these fasteners and this bill of material and this incredibly complex thing together, why can't we just design it and do it out of one machine? There's that little book that if I built a car, if any of you have read it, it's sort of dreaming like that. But that's what we're doing at Local Motors. And Michelle has won the, the, the honor to be the first design that's going to be made. We will print this car for real in September, two versions of it, and drive it off the show floor at the International Manufacturing and Technology Show in Chicago. So if you have an opportunity to come or to see it, you'll be, get a chance to see what we're doing. Okay, so we're gonna just spend a little bit more time on what we're doing. Same process, we'll put this through a micro factory, but the key thing about our micro factory is there is no need to have 100 machines to gain an economy of scale. I don't believe in an economy of scale. You heard me say it right here. I make cars, I build things, but I don't believe in an economy of scale. I believe in an economy of scope in today's life. I believe in having an economy, but I believe that economy should be based on our company's ability and our community's ability to rapidly change and almost in a sense, out China, China. I lived and worked in China for three years and I have great respect for how product development works in that country. It's free to steal someone's idea in many cases. Well, if you're gonna do that, why not? If you can't beat them, join them. Let's go forward and have it be an economy of scope. Let's make our critical core competitive advantage to be able to go from one idea to the next more quickly and put it into a customer's hands. That is exponential. So the Strati will be next. We've designed the Cruiser. Not everything has to look futuristic. This is a motorized bicycle that comes in electric or gas. We've designed the Verado. The Verado is not a car at all. It's a thousand watt electric motor downhill drifting trike for kids. We crowdfunded this product. We crowdfunded it, and we did it in less than 48 hours. All of the capital that came in the development of this product was paid for by consumers, and not by people that wanted a share of our aura, not for people that really wanted to give us a dollar and say, we love you. It wasn't that kind of crowdfunding, that Kickstarter-like crowdfunding. This was old-school vehicular crowdfunding. Hey, I'll give you the money for one if you promise to give me the product. That's what it was about. And I didn't have to go to an investor and say, could I, mother, may I please have money for this product because I promise that it will sell. Because we went right to the people who said, could I, may I please have the product? And we said, sure, if enough of you want it, then we'll make it. Crowdfunding is going to revolutionize hardware product development in the future. And if we can start it with a $1,600 product, just think what we can do in a couple of years with rocket ships. That is a true exponential difference. So, a little bit more. We have to sell them, as I promised, and we do more than just sell the products that we make. We also look for other innovative companies. This was a hard lesson for me. I thought, no, we're the only people that do innovative stuff. Well, it turns out we're not the only people that do innovative stuff and that our community happens to know a whole lot of people that are innovative. So what we do do is we curate some of those products that fit very well in our pipeline. So we take between six and 10 products a week into local motor store and we bring them in. We're an international reseller of the MakerBot 5th gen. We're, uh, and then beyond that, we go into getting the first carbon fiber reinforced PLA filaments. So if any of you are 3D printers, you know that that's really not available on the market, but it is from us. And so the opportunity to be able to go into the techniques of making things happen quickly and curate great products that are coming out, we hunt down Indiegogo and Kickstarter campaigns. We just launched the Boosted Board. I had the Boosted Board, this is a great electric skateboard. I, we had that in our factory three years ago when they were just dreaming up this thing. And now we're the first people to bring it out as a uh, distributed product. So uh, um, 
Next, uh, the way we look, we feel very strong about our retail. So this is our latest store that opened in Knoxville, Tennessee. So we have three micro factories right now, in case you were wondering. We are in Phoenix, we are in Las Vegas, and we're in Knoxville, Tennessee. Each one is close to either a big university or a capability for development. In Knoxville, we're working on the 3D printed car. In Phoenix and Vegas, we build the Rally Fighter, and we split up all kinds of other efforts from STEM education to adult involvement for our products. And uh, we are incredibly interested in making our spaces free and open open and available to people. So uh, um, uh, that is sort of a little bit about what our footprint looks like. Next up is Germany, after that Middle East, South Asia, and we will have 50 factories up in the next five years and 100 in the next 10 years. So uh, um, Local Motors is based in that. Now, um, uh, there's a lot of theory that underpins this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here and I'm just going to sum it up in one uh, um, comment. And that is that uh, um, Bill Joy, who was the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, once said um, in an interview, he was asked, how'd you get all those smart people to work at Sun? And he said, you know, I, the unfortunate part is, whoever you are, the smartest people work for somebody else. You know, God, that's just a real pain in the ass if you're a head of HR. But the fact of the matter is he was predicting what the internet was gonna do to his business and so many others. So the theory that underpins what we're doing is how in an exponential age do you harness all these incredible ideas and drive them toward a community of passion? Well, we started doing that for cars. But the punchline is that after we did that, we realized we could do it for so many other products. And so we have just announced that we are going to now power all of GE's appliance development, product development, and uh, you will see it come through a community that's much like Local Motors, but it's built on its own passion, and that's called First Build. So First Build takes the what GE wants to do to move its production forward, and instead of saying we'll give up productive capacity and send those things overseas to make them in a contract factory. It says we're gonna make them locally and we're gonna do them in small volume and we're gonna see whether customers want it and if they do and we can sell it, then we're gonna charge our big factories to put these things at 300,000 unit a year and a million unit a year volume. So it's still about manufacturing but it's about doing things like we started with vehicle innovation and driving it forward faster. That's what we're doing at Local Motors. We started in cars. We're doing it for appliance innovation right now. And next up, watch out. Healthcare, space, firearms, mechanical, cyber mechanical, cyber physical devices of any ilk, furniture even, there is no place that can hide from this method of innovation. And if we're not the company that exposes it, you may be running the company that does. So thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to share with Local Motors. Thank you.